So this is one incredibly hot week. Yes, it and is you love that. wonderful because it's summer and we have people who complain when it's cold and people who complain when it's hot and we just need to accept and enjoy and be delighted. Indeed. In. And our kids have really no idea of yesteryear when we packed, in our case, it was nine people in the battle wagon, the station wagon, but you had 14 people packed into the station wagon with the old-fashioned air conditioning, which was... Just rolling down the windows, literally rolling, cranking the crank. God, I'm still counting my blessings All that you've done in my life The more that I look in the details The more of your goodness I find Everybody and welcome to another episode of Ignite Radio Live from the Live It Room. We are so blessed to have you with us, literally here in our living room. If you go to IgniteRadioLive.com, you can click on the YouTube, Facebook, or Spotify links and see this playing live or later on, the recorded version. Very blessed to have you with us. You are with Greg and Stephanie Schleter over the five mighty stations of Annunciation Radio for the Almighty. And we invite you once again to go more deeply into this great adventure of marriage and family by going to ilovemyfamily.us. And there you will find different resources, but in particular, we point you to the Live It, Image Trinity, the Live It Gathering Guide, yeah. where you will find different questions and opportunities um, to foster a deeper culture in your home, to mm. talk and to pray, very much focusing on the upcoming Sunday readings. So make summer that time, even though it seems busier, there's a lot more flexibility usually, and just commit to mm. it once a week. Try it for seven weeks and see the grace that the Lord will pour upon you Indeed. and your family. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Lord Jesus, on this stormy sea that many of us often feel we are on, make us mindful, Lord, that our boats are not truly safe or peaceful until we are mindful of your presence and turn to you. We give you permission to awaken in these souls that you made for your indwelling spirit and to speak aloud to those storms, quiet, be still. Draw us more deeply into you, Lord Jesus, to live fully our call to image the Trinity. We ask this in your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, amen. so glad that you guys are with us. You can hear us over the radio or, of course, watch us live on these formats. You can find it at IgniteRadioLive.com. And our key theme that we're really kind of focusing is heaven come to earth. It's both a big proclamation. By the way, there's power in proclamation. Heaven has come to earth in mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. He has dominion. He has no rival. And we need to call upon him, though. It doesn't just happen. He made us for himself, but we have to declare that, uh, declare that with his authority to have authority over our lives. So proclamation and also a pursuit. Most of us find ourselves, depending on the time of the day, maybe overcome by those waves that are kicking into our boats and we feel like, you know, the thing's going to be capsized. So we need to pursue all the more this mindset that Christ indeed made us for himself to mm -hmm. inhabit us and uh, that we all the more live in the fullness of our Christianity. So three things tonight. We're going to begin with the gospel. I'm kind of tipping off what the gospel is with this allusion to being in the boat and Jesus and all of that, followed by an incredible, I think, time together in this very room, the live it room, our home, where so much happens, so much formation, relationship, bickering, bantering, growth, the things that happen in a home happen, have happened right here. And we've hosted many events here. Two weeks ago, we had treasurer, Ohio treasurer Robert Sprague with us. Delighted to hear him share his heart more than just politics as he's going to be running for governor in 2026. He is running for governor 2026. But to hear deeper at a deeper level uh, beyond politics, beyond Republican versus Democrat, his insight, I think, into the kind of order that we can all contribute to a kind of order that has the capacity to help us become the best version of ourselves. So he gives a presentation, and some of those we invited asked some really good questions. That's going to happen second. And, of course, we're going to conclude with some consideration of consequential things that dot our landscape, that dot, let's face it, sometimes a battlefield. We need to be anchored in prayer personally, 
leading then with our spouse, overflowing to that relationship with our spouse and our children. And yes, as we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to be engaged in this landscape, in these very particular issues. issues. And we're so grateful to catholicvote.org and their daily loop, which gives us little tidbits that help us to stay attuned in this very consequential season that Christians are very much called to participate in. So... With no further ado, we're going to begin with the gospel from this coming Sunday. I think I got it. All right. You proclaim it. I will. A reading from the gospel according to Mark. Glory to to you, you, O Lord. Lord. On that day, as evening drew on, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. A violent squall came up, and waves were breaking over the boat, so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Quiet, be still. The wind ceased, and there was great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this whom even wind and sea obey? The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ. So again, encouraging you with your family to gather together. Even if you just read the gospel but all the more if in this Live It Gathering Guide at ilovemyfamily.us with the great questions, daily questions, and all of that, but just focused on this gospel. And even more of the three parts to the questions, just the first question. Consider offering this to your family today, tomorrow, when you proclaim the gospel, maybe with them gathered before Sunday, what struck you in this reading, challenged you, inspired you, What questions did it raise? Steph, what stands out for you? This is one that I know myself, but I know many others who love to pray with this particular passage. Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. just the reminder of Christ being in the boat and, um, you know, all the things that swirl around us Mm -hmm. and just to kind of put ourselves into that. But this time around, for me, a few of the things that jumped out, um, one is a question. The part of the thing, as you just said, was what questions did it raise? Um, Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. Like uh, the cushion kind of jumped out. Um, That's my question. Like, what's the significance of that? Because I feel like every, everything in scripture has significance. Mm. So that's a question to look into. Um, But the, uh, you're not going to answer it. I don't know what it means. I haven't had time to, to like really ponder that. So maybe Mm. by the end of the show, (laughs) you might hear, a little, a little cushion update, because um, I love pillows and cushions. Indeed, you have your cushion the comfy, over there, which the they would see if they went to ignite.radiolive.com and saw the visual version. Yeah, there you have it. As well it. as your amazing hand gestures. Oh, okay, here and we go. And your beautiful dress. <laughs> All right, so looking at my own life mm. and really praying into it, we know the different things. I think when we hear this gospel, we think of the circumstances that become those squalls, right? The waves, you know, whether it's a financial difficulty or a marriage issue or, mm-hmm. you know, different struggles with children, um, different, uh, you know, older parents, like so many things, different issues at work, a friend who's betrayed us, you know, just mm. the, the circumstances that surround us. But this time I thought, gosh, what are those things those squalls, if you will, that I create, mm. that, that I, I kind of guide the boat into, you know, in my own personal life. What's it, an example? So whether it's, you know, the, a lack of virtue in many different seasons, so right? So kids are being grumpy and you reciprocate with grumpiness or impatience or whatever. And you're you saying that's what I did? Well, I'm just <laughs> looking for an example. I'm trying to make I'm it kidding. concrete and real. No, so yes. Yeah, so, we do that. So, do that. you know, impatience or yeah. a lack of trust or um, uh, wasting time, right? Filling our boat, what are those, of busyness. We fill mm. our boat with, um, you know, uh, stuff, just stop, digital just not focused on what we should yeah. be. And then we're like, Lord, where are you? And, you know, with that frustration that comes. So 
it, the, the whole trust thing strikes me. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really struck me this time, and I don't know if it's because we had a, a recent story from uh, our daughter, speaking of our granddaughter, uh, and I'll, I'll reread the section that made me think of it, but when we read scripture, I think so often mm -hmm. We give a voice, like we don't give Jesus the benefit of the doubt ever, <laughs> I feel. Hmm. So like we, you know, always read a harsher tone into his oh, voice. Oh, in that sense. And sometimes maybe that harsher tone is there. But I think like in this gospel, for example, um, it says he woke up, rebuked, like I'm ready to hear he rebuked the disciples, mm. right? But he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, quiet, be still. And then he says, he asks them, why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? And so you can read that or pray with it in many different tones. Like so often as parents, right? The first thing that tone I read into it is one of frustration, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? Come on, people. You know, how often... Do we do that? And then we place that on the Lord mm. or, you know, so whether it's impatient or ticked off or whatever, when maybe perhaps it was like a sadness or a, um, a longing for them to understand like, uh, oh, why are you terrified? What, you know, do you not yet have faith? You know, so our granddaughter had a little scary situation, kind of like stranger danger kind of moment. And um, you know, it wasn't her dad saying to her, you know, you should be afraid you're safe. It was very much a reassurance and mm. a, a teachable moment of, no, I have you. I'm with you. I won't let anything happen to you. So I think that struck me this Can time. Can I pause you on that also. first point? So mm -hmm. your point then to that is that My rambling. Well, Christ is not, God is not first and foremost, a reprimander in chief. Hmm. A stern reprimander in chief, like get it right here, people. Um, he's kind of entering into intuiting whatever flaw or whatever weakness that we have and connecting at that level and kind of like a little bit of a lifting, encouraging, like getting behind it and lifting us up to recognize that he's in it and always right. pointing toward himself. Yeah. Like we can't do it apart from him. Mm -hmm. Like often you think, okay, why don't you have faith? You're in the boat. He's kind of saying, you know, I'm going to demonstrate to you all the more when he says, quiet, be still, and there goes our light, it's fine, quiet, be still, um, that, you know, I, I am part of this mm -hmm. with you. I am in the boat with you. You have no reason to be worried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I also think with that reading, um, you had two points. Were both points contained yeah, there? Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so... The um, one was how much other stuff we bring in ourselves. Okay. That we choose versus just the circumstances that surround God us. Is. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is a reminder of our nature. Christ mm -hmm. is speaking to us. Because if he's saying have faith, is he not affirming that we have this capacity to be filled with his spirit? Like, think about that. Would Jesus encourage us or challenge us for something that is doesn't exist he knows us better than we know ourselves mm. so if he's saying to you and me right now in the storms of our lives have faith the beauty is that we have the capability of not allowing those things to stir us and to hear his voice say quiet be still there is a little bit of a shift for me as i read this and i often ask the question how are we meant to be christ to others mm. right now whom are we thinking of that is beleaguered by a storm in their life. Maybe it's a whole attitude of storm because they just grew up with That's so, so many difficulties mm -hmm. and their whole lens, everything is drama, everything is difficult. But the question like you kind of elucidated with Christ is elucidated. how did Jesus how did Good Jesus point. approach them, right? How are we meant to approach these people to have the heart of Christ, to approach mm -hmm. them and encourage them to know, hey, he's in this with you. And in fact, we're the ones or I should say, we're the means through which Christ is there, giving that word of encouragement, that word of helping them, if you will, dispel those storms. You know, just yeah. in light of that last comment, we were talking about this recently with some friends, but in community, like how much easier it is to, to go through things, the difficult times, the storms mm. of life. Like if you are by yourself having to deal with something, we all know, like it is, it is, feels so much bigger and mm. is so much bigger. But when you are able to be with somebody alongside of you, encouraging mm. you, loving you, um, being Christ to you, hopefully it's your spouse, but you know, mission friendship, as we've been speaking mm. of, it's just a whole different ball game. 
and that is the theme, Mission Friendship. Last episode, again, IgniteRadioLive.com, we talked about this to a good degree, and it really focuses, increasingly speaks to us about our mission. Certainly marriage and family, homes can be that place, should be that primary place of encounter, but so much more than the big events, and we've been part of those, we've led some of those, We feel, as we talk to really godly commentators and leaders in this arena, what's most consequential is that we are connecting, not with the many, but with the few that we can journey with, that we can, uh, on on this road, right, that um, we can get to know their lives and their experiences and regular forms of encouragement, not just those touch points, you know, once a month or once a week, but are we truly involved in the journeys of those people in our lives? So we're all about fostering that. Our mission is friendship. Increasingly, we're going to say that, reflect upon that, and try to facilitate that. And by the way, this Live It guide that you can get at ilovemyfamily.us is a great place to start. Mm. If not your family, and we're challenging you for seven weeks to do this and discover the power that it can have by gathered time to experience God's grace poured in in relationship. But a group, bring together three, four people in your home. If you're married or if you're single, bring together people and go through this Live It Gathering guide. There is a group version. With that said, we are now going to move on to the second part of our Ignite Radio Live episode tonight. Very blessed. Uh, Again, to share with you a very meaningful exchange, presentation and exchange with Ohio Treasurer Robert Sprague. As we all know, we've had a disappointment with Ohio's Issue 1, now making it a constitutional right to have an abortion up until the moment of birth. And this is not hyperbolic. I know every politician in the state of Ohio that has worked on pro-life issues. I know the ones who mean it, and I know the ones who only do it for their resume. In that state issue, there was not a single politician, statesman in this state that could possibly compare to what Robert did. He was there every day. He traveled the entire state at his own expense. He showed up. He wrote checks. He was the soldier of soldiers, and we will never forget that. It was my pleasure to bring uh, several of us together for dinner to meet Robert. We have big hopes that he will pursue um, the claim for the next governor of the state of Ohio. Married, wonderful Christian man, five children. Present you, Robert Sprague. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I didn't know what I was supposed to do here. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Greg made me sit in the grandpa chair over here, so I. You know, I gotta, that's right. That's right. Um, which we would we would love we would love to be grandparents um, sometime soon. But uh, just a little, I, I guess, about me. The things that Jeff didn't share. Amanda and I have been married for 24 years this year, and we do have five children. My standard joke on the campaign trail is simply this: that it's pretty unusual nowadays to have a big family. It's a lot like having a waterbed. It used to be that everybody had one, but now they're just weird. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, I, I'll tell you uh, that that you know, having a big family, you probably think that we're Catholic. Uh, we're not Catholic. We're just very active Presbyterians. Uh, and so, my wife, uh, a man, and I, and, and our five children, we go to yeah, an evangelical church um, called Gateway in Finley, Ohio. Um, our kids were all educated at St. Michael's uh, in grade school and in middle school. And then everybody uh, is now older. And so, you know, I think that I'm still on my faith journey. Um, it's been fantastic. Uh, we talked a little bit about blessings that we have in our lives. And I was thinking that I would talk about my son Graham getting back from Costa Rica and, you know, the thoughtfulness that he left us a note, which, you know, as a parent, you're like, he left us a thank you note. We we're blown away. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a tender-hearted kid and a good kid, but still, to get a thank you note was really nice. Um, coming back from Costa Rica, and we're very glad that he's back. Um, but I also was thinking about talking about my, my friend Gary Harps. And uh, Gary's um, older, you know, he's in his 70s, and he's been a spiritual mentor to me. And uh, when I first got back to Finley, Gary said, look, he said, uh, Robert, I'd love to have breakfast with you once a week and go through a Bible study and take you through it. And it, it, that really produced a lot of growth in my own life. Um, and then it's been you know, a journey to share that with my children, 
Um, and Amanda does a great Bible study with Mary Hannah in the evenings, which is kind of a, they're going through a middle school Bible study, which I think has been a, a real blessing both to Mary Hannah and also Amanda. Um, but I think, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, the, oh, it was you, Mike. You said, um, isn't that right? Uh, you, you said that it was, you were encouraged to share your faith uh, at work. Yeah, and I hard. thought, yeah, and I thought, I'm, I'm really not. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in the in the public square, and I think that's, and I think that that is something that we have to change. We have to change, and I and I think that it, and I've thought a great deal about this, and I think that if you're going to change the culture of the state of Ohio, and you want to bring God back to the public square. Because, you know, ultimately, um, goodness comes from God. And you remember the, the story of uh, the, young, uh, the young rich boy that came up to Jesus and said, Good teacher, uh, what do I have to do to get into heaven? By the way, I don't quote scripture very well, so I'm going to like paraphrase. I'm not, I'm not good at that. You have a Bible or something, I could use you it. But... Make it yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm in? I'm in. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Thanks for bailing me out. I appreciate it. And Jesus, you know, Jesus's response is, "Why do you call me good? There's only one who's good." Uh, and then he tells the young man to follow all the commandments. And he says, "I've done those all my life." And he says, "Great, sell everything and give it to the poor and come follow me." And that's the way to get into heaven. And you know, goodness. That's what Jesus said. There's only one who's good, and that's God. Um, and so if we, don't, if we don't acknowledge God in the public square, and I don't know if you feel this way about our political system or about what's happening in the world in general, but I feel like we've lost a lot of our goodness over the past 10 years. Right? And it's not because of a political party or a candidate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about in general. I see it in my kids. I see them on their phone so much. Um, it's this isolation. You know, It's not this wonderful sense of community like we have here tonight where Believers are encouraging each other and sharing with each other. Um, more and more, we're prone to be isolated individuals, and I think it's taken a real toll on our society. And the only people that seem to be able to break through are the people that, quite frankly, are very hateful. And um, and I think that that is, it's, it's not just the presence of hate, I think it's also the absence of love. Mm-hmm. And so I think that you know, in order to, to change this in our society, and we talked a little bit about the defeat of issue one. And on a go-forward basis, uh, in our state, if we're going to change, we're going to change the state of affairs in the Ohio Constitution, where abortion of a fully formed child about to be born is allowed under, and guaranteed under the Ohio Constitution, which I think is very, very disturbing and sick. Mm-hmm. Um, it, in order to change that, you know, you're, you, you have to change voters' hearts and minds at this point. That was what the last election said to me, was losing in August with you know, 58% of the vote, not wanting to raise the constitutional threshold to 60%, and then losing again in November by the exact same percentage, 58% of the vote, says to me that, you know, there's not a, a political message or a talented, charismatic leader that all of a sudden can just change this. What ultimately has to be changed is the culture of the state of Ohio. And, you know, if you think about culture, whether it's in your business, um, you know, it, or, or whether it's in a state or any organization, you know, behavior really comes from values. And values are determined by culture, right? And culture, ultimately is really determined by the leader of that organization. You know, and unless you have leaders that are willing to talk about God's goodness and trying to bring a people of salt and light back to the public square, um, we're never going to be able to change the culture in the state of Ohio. And, and I think that it's tremendously important that we do three things with regards to Ohio's culture. Um, the first is, I think that we need to protect people of faith from being able to share their faith. And I'm not talking just about Christians. I'm talking about Muslims or Hindus or Jews, whatever your religion is. I mean, we need people who are good people that are willing to do things for others. 
And right now, if you're a Christian, you're afraid of expressing your faith. Why? Because you could be fired. You could be fired for it at work or in the classroom or you know, during your occupation. You absolutely are run, run a danger of being fired these, these days. And it's that fear and it's that uncertainty and that doubt that prevents people from expressing their faith. You know, I'm all in favor. Look, if, if, if you know, my son, Tate, is in a classroom, you know, and there is someone of the Jewish faith who's, who's his teacher, and she has a menorah on her desk, right? And, and Tate asks her, well, what's the menorah? What is that about? And she, she should be able to express to Tate, well, this is what I believe, and here's why I believe it, and here's why the menorah is on my desk, and here's the, here's the background, and here's the history of that. And, you know, she doesn't have to say to Tate, you have to believe this, right? But simply sharing that with him is a gift, I think. I don't know, maybe you disagree, but I think that's a gift because it allows you know, my son and anyone to be able to make an informed decision because we're all in search of truth. We're all in search of truth and purpose. You know, that God has created those holes in our hearts and everyone on the face of the earth is searching for truth and purpose and we're all struggling with something. All right? And so to be able to express your own faith uh, in a way that teaches others and allows them to learn about it would make us a better society, in my opinion. And we need to protect people of faith from being able to express their faith, whatever it is. Um, so I think that's the first piece. And there's a lot of different programs that are around that. There's the Respect Project. I don't know if you've heard of that nationally, where they go in and they try to educate schools and other institutions about you know what your what rights you are guaranteed under the under the uh, United States Constitution. What employers can and can't do uh, to people as they're expressing their faith. So I think that you know that's the first thing is we need to just allow people of faith to be themselves in the public square. Um, the second thing is back to back to the issue of life. Um, we need to not just make abortion illegal in the state of Ohio but, or unthinkable in the state of Ohio, we really need to make life irresistible mm -hmm. in the state of Ohio. You know, and those are, th those are similar things, but it's a, it's a little bit of a different focus. And what I mean by that is there are many organizations out there, many of them Catholic in nature and, and have foundations of faith that want to go out and help children, want to go out and help young moms. I, would, I just toured a... Uh, a Catholic uh, organization down in Cincinnati, Ohio. When I was down there, I can't remember, like a Friday or Monday or whenever I was down there. I was, um, and that morning I went by, I think it was called Moms and Babes. And they've been around for 38 years helping mothers. And they have, they have, a, uh, they have a mobile clinic. They'll go out and talk with a young mom and help her with her mental health. They'll deliver diapers. I mean, they're there to care for her and her child. It's an amazing, amazing organization. And they even have an RV that they go around and park, uh, you know, at different places. And this brings people together. They'll, you know, go to like the local festivals down in Cincinnati and they'll park the RV there and welcome, you know, young moms and children in and give them, give them food and give them diet and give them love. You shouldn't be prevented from receiving state funds, in my opinion, for helping a young mother or a baby just because you have the the name Jesus in your founding documents, or that's your mission. If your mission says that we follow Jesus, you should not be excluded from being able to help children and, and young moms. And so, you know, we need to find a way to plug in uh, organizations of faith into the state because ultimately they do incredible work. So I think that's the second, I think that's the second piece of this um, is we need to make sure that... Um, that organizations of faith can plug in, into the state. And then I think the third piece of changing culture in the state of Ohio is you have to have your leaders talk about it. Um, and you have to have your leaders show up and not just express faith, but do things. You know, take action um, and go and try to help people. I mean, imagine having some public officials that were to show up at the local women's pregnancy center to help some young moms or hand out diapers 
or go to uh, the single mom's house that you talked about with Mike and others and, you know, be able to go and, I don't know, drink a beer and spend two hours with, with other people that want to try to help somebody else. Think if you had a, you know, public officials, we need to show up for that sort of thing. You know, we need to set the example. You know, it shouldn't just be on individual organizations. We need to show up, and we need to do these things. And if people saw us doing that and leading our lives, following Christ and trying to do good for others, um, I think that there would be a tremendous, um, a tremendous response to that around the state. So I think those are kind of you know, three different pieces that I've thought a great deal about from a, from a public policy standpoint or um, you know, that need to be added to the state of Ohio. I think what you want me to do is kind of justify entering the political realm or staying in touch politically. But what I will say to you is Socrates has this phenomenal quote that he said, the punishment of you not engaging essentially in civic duty is that you have to live under the rule of lesser men, uh, so to speak. So, you know, if you, I guess my, and my point in this would be, if you don't participate, you kind of have to accept then the system. Right, because other people will participate, um, and it's not just the presence of darkness that's such a problem in our society today. It's the absence of light. And if good people refuse to participate, and you know, if Robert just says, oh, "You know, I got other things that I can be doing with my life. I'm going to focus on my kids. I'm going to just focus on Amanda." Maybe 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 that's what I should be doing, but um, she'd probably say, "Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's not enough focus here." But but if everybody just says that, honestly, our democracy doesn't work anymore. You know, that's not the way our government is built. Our government is not built to have a few people that hold all this power, because what happens is that absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, you know, that's a, a law of physics, and so. If you don't have people of faith, if you don't have good people that are willing to participate in the process, we will lose our republic. It's just that simple. The second thing I will say is um, you're right in that there are many people that are becoming disenchanted and they don't want to participate. And I remember talking to one, one guy and he said, Robert, he said, you need, this is why I'm running for state rep, all right? As he said, look, you just need to get out and meet people. You need to go knock on doors when it's raining. And I was like, why when it's raining? He said, because if you knock on doors when it's raining, you know the other guy isn't, right? You know, and you're doing something that, that that's, you're, you're going to be able to get ahead. And what I would say to you is that a lot of people are tuning out and they're exiting, which means if you participate, it's actually that much more meaningful. You have a chance to have a greater impact. Um, if you're if you're engaged, and you can do that a lot of different ways, um, so I think that I think that there for for there to be hope for our country uh, and for our democracy. And by the way, the third thing I would like to say about this, and I don't know, if I shouldn't mention this, but I'm amazed at, at the amount of hate uh, bet- between our between our political parties. And you know, as I look to the future of my state. I don't want you to elect me because you hate the other guy. I really don't. I'm not running against someone else. I'm running for you. I'm running for my state because I think that things need to happen within my state and I have a vision and I think that if we accomplish this vision that things will be better for all of us. But nowadays, the two top political parties really just want you to hate the other guy. That's the whole point, right? They're like, well, our guy is flawed. But if we can make him hate the other guy more... It's going to motivate all of our people to come out. That's what I see right now in the political process. And I think to myself, man, like this is what the United States of America, this is what we're doing here in terms of our political process? Why, why aren't we talking about policy? Why aren't we talking about vision? Why aren't we talking about hope? Like we're, what we're going to be in the future, how we can be better as a people. Uh, the world is on fire. Have you looked at what's happening? Mm-hmm. October 7th, you know, Hamas flows over the Israeli border. And all of these Hamas militants literally take their machine guns and they try to kill as many Jews as they can find. As many Jews as they can find. And in one instance, 
I know for a fact, cut open the belly of a pregnant mother, chop the head off the baby inside of her, and then chop the mother's head off, and then recorded it on a GoPro camera to put on Facebook or some social media. And I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, ladies, that said that. But you need to know, because these are the kinds of things that went on. So October the 10th, I get a call from the Israel Bonds in New York City. And they said, Robert, the state of Ohio has bought Israel Bonds for the last 30 years. Democrats, Republicans, both parties have bought Israel Bonds. We need to raise $100 million in two days. Would the state of Ohio buy some more Israel bonds? And I said, well, look, I'll, I'll talk with our director of investments. And we had a conversation, and it became clear that we were going to take on risk. These had always been great investments in our portfolio. And under any other circumstance, we automatically would have said yes, because they're some of our highest yielding investments in our portfolio. And they allow us great diversification. But in this particular instance, there was a lot of doubt and uncertainty because of the war that was about to happen and the attack that ju just occurred. And I told my team, I said, look, I said, if we stand by and do nothing, we really benefit the attacker. Right? Like if someone, if someone attacks somebody else and I'm standing there and, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to be neutral. I'm going to be neutral. Really what I'm doing is I'm benefiting the person that's the aggressor, right? That's who I'm benefiting in that scenario. And I said, we are not going to benefit these people that are doing these horrible, horrible things. And so we stepped in, and I called my, my friend Glenn Hagar. He's down in Texas. And I said, Glenn, I said, we want to do, we want to do a fifth of this raise. We want to do $20 million tomorrow. And... Uh, Glenn's like one of the few people in the United States of America that has a bigger balance sheet than I do. And, uh, and, and Glenn is a good man and a good Christian, too, and a good friend. And Glenn's, I said, Glenn, I know, I know you at your own fiduciary responsibilities and the needs of your portfolio, but I would love it tomorrow if we could do something together. And we're doing $20 million and, you know, you could do $20 million too. And so uh, the following day, we released. We did, we did a press release that we did 20 million, and Texas did a press release that they they did 20 million too. And uh, Stacy Garrity, Colonel, former Colonel in the United States Army, Treasurer of Pennsylvania, courageous woman, uh, incredible person. She did 20 million. Jimmy Petronas down in Florida did 20 million. The Comptroller of Texas, uh, and then Joe Abruzzo did 20 million to the West Palm Beach Treasurer. And we took down the hundred million in a single day. All right. And my point is, it's just you know, I mean, on Monday, uh, it's sitting in in the Ohio Treasury, and on Tuesday, when you buy that bond, it's sitting in the state of Israel, and it's going to build, you know, to try to help the state of Israel survive this attack and survive this war. So um, anyway, so my point in all this is, you know, if people remain neutral, if you do nothing. You know, evil is going to win. And so, and, and that's, by the way, it's, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. And it's time that our country wakes up to what's happening in the world and what's happening here at home, and we have to participate. Um, we have to participate. Uh, I'm going to run for governor in 2026, and my vision for the state of Ohio is four simple things. The first is we need to restore God to the public square. And you know, we talked a great deal about that tonight. And I'm happy to answer any questions on any of these. Uh, but the second piece is, I believe that since 1971, uh, John Gilligan at the time, who was the governor, instituted the state's first income tax. Now you think about, we're sitting here in Toledo, Ohio. Think about what Toledo, Ohio was in 1970. And then think about what Toledo was in 1990. Really, if you think about it, 1971 began the stagnation of a lot of communities like Finley and Fostoria and across our entire state. It really did. And we've had to compete with that lodestone tied around our neck for the last 50 years. And it's time for us to eliminate it. And as governor, I'm going to eliminate the income tax of the state of Ohio once and for all. And everybody says, oh, like it can't be done. You're getting too much revenue for it, from it. Look, you can do it over time. 
if you do one simple thing, you limit the growth of government spending to inflation plus population growth. And over time, GDP, the gross domestic product of the state of Ohio, is going to grow faster, much faster than that. And you take the excess and you put it into an income tax reduction fund and you click it down over time and you never let it go up. And you will eventually be able to eliminate the income tax. And we will be a state where you keep what you earn, where you keep what you earn. And I think that it will make Ohio the most competitive state in the Midwest to make things once again. So that's the first piece. The second piece, uh, I'm sorry, the, that's the second piece. The third piece is that, as I said, we have, we have five children in our family. And one of the things that we tell our children um, is to be more successful like uh, Seth uh, Schleter. That's what we tell our, our kids. <laughs> is, no, no, wait, no, wait, that's not right. That, we, what we tell them is we tell them that they are not guaranteed anything because their last name is Sprague in life. But what they're guaranteed by the United States Constitution is that in the United States of America, they get to write their own story. Right? And it's not always the story that dad wants for you. It's not the story that mom wants for you. But you need to look back at the scroll of your life and know, my kids need to know, that they put every word on that scroll. They made those choices, and they got to realize their own destiny. You know, and they got to fulfill God's purpose in their lives. And there's a tremendous amount of self-confidence and self-esteem and self-realization when you get to write your own story in the United States, right? Just like what your son has done. And, um, and not everybody's story is the same. You know, God has made us all different. Nobody gets to write their own story if they're living in poverty on a government program here in the state of Ohio. We are taking that from people. And let me tell you, all these government programs were built for a time in our state when the public policy problem was that we did not have enough jobs for all of our people. Corning's Illinois was leaving, right? The steel was leaving Youngstown. The glass was leaving Toledo. The National Cash Register was leaving Dayton, right? We know the stories. It was the deindustrialization of the Midwest. We did not have enough jobs for all of our people. What's the problem now? We don't have enough people for all the jobs. Wait a second. For the first time in my entire adult lifetime, the problem is now that we don't have enough people for all the jobs. There is no reason why we can't lift people up now who are living in poverty and get them a good job and a great career here in the state of Ohio. The time has come. And instead of putting the focus on the on-ramp, we need to put the focus on the off-ramp. How do we help people get back into the private sector and write their own story here in the state of Ohio? And then the final piece is um, we need to burn some things down in Columbus. So let me tell you, uh, First Energy, which is an electric utility in the state of Ohio, they spent $61 million in a bribe and gave it to Larry Householder, Speaker of the Ohio House. And he passed a corrupt piece of legislation called House Bill 6. And he's sitting in federal prison now for 20 years. And a lot of people look at that and they're like, wow, this was a bad guy, a corrupt politician. What most people don't realize is that the increased electricity rates that were passed by House Bill 6 Half of those are still being collected by the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio mm -hmm. and given to the companies. And one company in particular that admitted to paying the bribe. Are you kidding me? This is the way our institutions are working in the state of Ohio? All the people that were involved in the passage of that bill are still there. And nothing's being done about it. And here's the worst part, and you need to be upset about this. The $61 million, you know where they got it from? <laughs> oh, that would be good. No, they didn't get it from the pension. They included it in their rate case. They got it from you. They charged you in your electric bills. You're wondering why your electric bills are so high? They charged you in the electric bills for the $61 million bribe that they gave to him and other money that they spent. Unbelievable. It's got to be reformed. And it's going to take an outsider from Northwest Ohio to do it. I'm telling you the truth. Because everybody that's down there right now 
hasn't done anything about it. So, you know, I think that as residents and citizens of the state of Ohio, you should at least expect your government to respect you. And they don't. You know? And and so those are the four pieces as as I'm looking at the governor's race in twenty twenty six that I'm committed to. And I'm telling you the truth, I think that if we did these four things, we would be the place to build things once again, not just in the Midwest, but in the United States of America, because we have water and we have power and natural gas and we've got a great workforce and we're a great place to raise your family. Why wouldn't you choose Ohio? Come and build it here. And I think that it will lead us to tremendous success and I think that we will have a revival as a state. De Tocqueville in the late 19th century said that um, the United States was really the envy of the world in education. When we look at the ed education system now, um, it's, it's a mere shadow of what it once was or what it could be. What is your vision for um, what maybe, what kind of reforms do you think need to be made? How can we make Ohio a state that provides the best, most meaningful um, education for our children? Well, I think one of the first things to realize is, you know, people are very critical of the public uh, school system. I'm not. We send our kids both to the Catholic uh, grade school and then the public high school. Um, you know, I think that there is good in both systems. But I can tell you this, just I, I don't know about the rest of you with uh, that have big families like ours, but God has made every one of our kids very, very different. And they need different things from different schools. And I love the idea of school choice, right? Because if, you're, if, if a certain school system is not working for your kid, you have to get them into something that works for them. And not everybody is built the same. And sometimes these schools are a little bit cookie cutter, you know, and they treat everybody the same. Um, and so I, I believe very strongly in school choice. Uh, I supported that when I was a state rep, and I think that it's a good thing. Because at the end of the day, it brings competition to the table, too. And it allows for innovation and new ideas. Um, and, and, and I believe that students want to be challenged. They want to be challenged, uh, not just in their faith. If you're part of uh, you know, a parochial school or you're part of a, um, a Christian school. But I think also they want to be challenged academically. And we are talking about St. John's earlier, right? I mean, boy, I'll tell you what. Their soccer team, <laughs> they are tough. They are really tough to beat. They're amazing, uh, really great. But, you know, I mean, their theme is, is that they, they, they have tremendous expectations for those young men. And I think that boys in general, for instance, want to have high expectations. They want to have discipline. Uh, they thirst for it. And so, you know, those type that, you know, the innovation that occurs when you allow uh, choice it allows private schools to be able to do those things that are necessary, uh, that are great fits for kids in our state. And I think that that's one of the ways that we uh, succeed educationally, is we allow choice and we allow innovation. So the, the, um, the alphabet mafia, I saw a, a graphic today grading all 50 states and their LGBTQ, whatever, XYZ, PDQ, um, friendliness level. And... Ohio had an F, which should be a pride, point of pride. No pun intended. <laughs> In June, point of pride. Um, I mean, where do you see all of the whole alphabet mafia in Ohio and, D and DEI? I mean, that's kind of two sides of it, but mm -hmm. it seems to be permeating everything, work, schools, everything else. Mm -hmm. So where are you on that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I guess I, I very firmly kind of believe in an and culture. And I think the and culture works like this, which is, you know, I'm Christian, this is what I believe, but and you're welcome to believe what you believe. Um, I think that people should be free to pursue that, but I don't think that um, it should be forced upon businesses and people of faith. I think that that's wrong. Uh, and you're beginning to see some, the Supreme Court take that up as well. Uh, where they are defending people of faith that say, like, no, I, I, I can't do that. It's part of my business. It's not part of my belief system. And uh, I think we need to respect people and respect their beliefs. Um, 
But uh, at the end of the day, you're right. I mean, the DEI culture has really taken over, not just um, corporate America, but all of the, the institutions and particularly the educational institutions. And in some cases, a lot of the schools are actually choosing professors and everyone on their faculty using DEI criteria. And uh, that has created, I think, a culture that celebrates uh, not just diversity, but also celebrates this idea of equity, which is the real problem, which is you know demanding uh, equal outcomes for individuals, regardless of how well they do on a test or what kind of a writer they are in the paper. Um, you know that all the kids get the same grade, and I think it's a, a real problem in our society. We need to be we need to include everyone. You know, diversity is good. That's great. We should all we should have diverse races, diverse religious beliefs. Everyone should be welcome. Um, but uh, oh, America is the land of equal opportunity. It's not the land of equal outcomes. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you want equal outcomes, uh, you know, that's more of a communist philosophy. And you know, I, I believe that there are other other places uh, that espouse that philosophy that have failed miserably. And I don't know why we haven't learned. Over the course of history, from you know those countries like Russia and like China, uh, that's not a place where I want to live. I mean, I think that there's a certain element of diversity that's needed and should be and should be a priority. Coerced, but not right, but not coerced. And if you and if you allow uh, the private market to work instead of forcing it on everyone, then that will happen naturally, is my belief. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm a kind of a libertarian in that respect. I believe in Milton Friedman. I think that if you allow people uh, the freedom of the opportunity and you allow people to hire who they want to hire, um, that that's the best model. Uh, you talked about the uh, uh, education bill. Would you support giving vouchers also to homeschoolers? Absolutely. Because that was voted down and the other one was accepted. Yeah, I think you know that was part of the backpack bill. And I think it's a great idea. Absolutely, I would support giving it to homeschoolers, 100%. Because I'll tell you, um, you know, I think that I'm, I'm amazed at some of the students that, uh, and, and the scholastic ability of, of individuals that are schooled at home. I'm amazed. And uh, absolutely, I think that that's 100% necessary. So, Steph, most people experience these speakers at big rallies and events, and we've been blessed to hear uh, Treasurer Robert Sprague at many events really connect with the heart of believers that transcends politics, and I really like that about him. And certainly, there is the political landscape and a particular view that we all ought to be educated on and understand, but how delightful that we were able to experience him in our own living room, to invite some friends to come together, to kind of really kind of be up close and personal and hear him talk about his family and his children and his faith and to have some of those we know so well in our community, all of them are Catholic. Robert Sprague is not Catholic, but that conversation, it even stirs up that kind of conversation about uh, an earnestness on the part of people with John 17, where the Lord prayed, I pray that they may be one as you are one. This is how that happens, bringing people together to talk. But as you saw it, do you have any outstanding thoughts you're outstanding. That's well, thank my thought. You, indeed. <laughs> um, no, like you said, just blessed. Real deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, very willing to uh, be present. And even afterwards, you know, just the one on ones that people had with him that he was very mm-hmm. comfortable with. And he was asked some tough questions, you know. And But I would say um, he definitely is a man of faith, um, very intentional, very sincere. And I also. I know Jeff Barefoot said this in his intro to him, Mm. but just um, when it comes to the pro-life issues, he was consistent and just a warrior for for the unborn. 100%. And that, you know, comes across in other ways, too, as he was answering Mm. questions. And um, I love his love of his family, Mm. as we're talking about family, you know, evidently his wife and children. And uh, that's always a good sign, if you will. 
For sure. Folks, you're tuned in to Ignite Radio Live, or you're watching us live on YouTube, Spotify, or Facebook as it is playing out live, or perhaps the recorded version after. Um, We're so grateful that you are plugged in. Please click on that subscribe tab so you don't miss any opportunity. And um, you can see all our other episodes at Ignite Radio Live also. I wanted to punctuate, Steph, as we shift from Treasurer Robert Sprague, again running for governor in 2026, um, and certainly a lot of debates Uh, are happening. We know I think the first presidential debate is the 27th coming up next week. We need to pray for that, pray for our country for a whole lot of reasons. And it's as much as I will say about that. But on the front of this, which you'll see if you're watching the visual version, my water bottle, my trusty water bottle, container, canister, I don't know what you call this. (laughs) Water um, bottle's good. (laughs) I've got a great sticker. I don't know who gave it to me. but your daughters. Okay, it's a beloved sticker. I think Catherine maybe gave this Mm -hmm. to me. St. Joan of Arc's quote, I am not afraid. I was born to do this. What if we looked at the storms of our lives and many of the things raised in our conversation with Treasurer Robert Sprague, and we were mindful that God custom designed us. He knows every hair on our head. He formed us, knit us together, as it says in the Psalms, in our mother's womb. Does he not know what we're dealing with in this moment, every circumstance of our lives? Let's pray for that grace of St. Joan of Arc, who, goodness, was in the epicenter of such a storm, right? 19 years old, a woman at a time, which did not honor women really as leaders, much less to lead the forces of France. Um, And Christ used her in a powerful way to navigate through so many difficulties. Mm -hmm. By the way, I encourage you to read the Mark Twain version. It's one of my favorite books ever, the account by Mark Twain of St. Joan of Arc. He describes it as, as his favorite book ever, which is a pretty tall order. But what if we could say, I am not afraid I was born to do this? With no further ado, we're going to turn to the loop. Again, catholicvote.org. Loop into the loop. A great mission organization that endeavors to engage us in our call to build the kingdom in the very concrete ways. And it looks like I may have lost my... You can use mine. I know I could use yours, but here it is. I will share. All right, I got the first one. So again, these are tidbits uh, that dot the landscape of our human existence, political, cultural, social, economic. And we read these so that, number one, we can be informed and pray for them. And number two, hopefully be an occasion as God calls us where necessary to act and to speak, to be his voice. Again, that Saul to Paul thing, Christ says to him, you know, in his question, you know, who are you? He says, you know, I am essentially the church. I am, it is the church that you are persecuting. I am the one you are persecuting, referring to the church. We are called to be Christ's presence in building this kingdom. So story one, welfare offices and other agencies are sending voter registration forms to non-citizen migrants. Yeah, was In every state except Arizona. Representative Chip Roy from Texas recently introduced legislation requiring proof of citizenship for prospective voters to receive such forms. Gosh. I can't even fathom this. Right, right. And again... God um, bless uh, Representative Roy. Right. He's a good guy. Well, and I think we have to be mindful of God's design of... um, subsidiarity, that we are called to take care of things in the most local area. We are called to have some uh, control and authority over the land that God has given us, as we do in our homes. We probably lock our doors. We probably have some measures of defense. The same for our nation. Without borders, without securing our borders and managing who comes into our country is not a responsible Christian move. Well, that's, I mean, that's not even the point of this story. I realize that. So that's a separate issue. So whether, whatever your opinion is on that, um, just bring to the table the discussion, should a non-citizen be given a, a voice in our election process? And I would strongly say, heck no. Let's, let's rein this in and see what's at play and who's behind it and all of that stuff. So let's move on. Well, I want to say that they are connected and they're connected connected in a way of disregarding that there is a principle, a Christian principle of having stewardship over that which God calls us to. And that includes not only our homes that we're called to protect or our communities, but our nation. And that means there's a legitimate filtering and process of becoming a citizen in the United States. And we need to respect and honor that. 
second story. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump on Saturday agreed to the finalized rules of their upcoming June 27th debate. Moderators will mute, sorry, moderators will mute the debater's microphones outside of speaking time. I don't know why they haven't done that in the past. Indeed, I support that. There will be no studio audience. Independent candidate RFK Jr. might still qualify for the debate, but he would need to to secure ballot access in several states over the next few days. That will be very interesting. That's all I will say. Um, And hopefully people can go in with uh, a loving, (laughs) open mind to see what's Mm. truly playing out there. 100%. So I'm glad they have rules. I'm glad they're doing it. We'll see how it goes. And it bears repeating that politics is not a canonization process. Uh, It's not about um, identifying perfection and holding up the standard of perfection. We pursue it. But politics is about the greatest good possible. And that's with regard to principles and policies much more than personalities. And I think that's a challenge to many of us to look what is at stake. What does the church teach us about the five non-negotiables? Because we are in this country given power and authority and we'll be held accountable with any other authority and power that we are given, election not the least of them. Then just a reminder that the enemy is not a person, but the enemy is the enemy, the devil. So let's keep that in mind. And remember to pray for all of our politicians, all of the candidates, um, because the Lord desires us all to be with him in heaven one day. So let's... Let's help each other there. Number three, the Biden administration sent FBI agents to the home of Vanessa Sivage, a nurse at Texas Children's Hospital. Sivage had asserted that staff at the hospital were committing Medicaid fraud in order to subject children to illicit transgender procedures. So you'd think that if you were acting illegally, that the Department of Justice and all of its aspects would be investigating you. But in this case, it's going after the person who's calling attention to something illegal, much worse, something that is very immoral, something that is ruining lives of young people. So, again, very important to be part of this. And the light turns on again. I think God agrees. (laughs) Worthy of our prayer and regard, because this is truly not just about um, honor, if you will, of one's feeling of their identity. This is a deeper question. All of us have disordered desires. Mine are not theirs. But which disordered desire is its own validation because we happen to have it? We all need to hear the voice of God telling us who we are, whose we are, and to live that out fully. A federal court ruled that the Biden administration's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission cannot force the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and other Catholic organizations to pay for employees' abortions. As Catholic Vote warned before the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act passed in 2022, the EEOC had used the legislation to try to push a pro-abortion agenda on Catholics. Again, Mm. we need to be mindful and aware of what's going on and not just pray, but take action to protect these rights. And just to make it clear again, it's bad enough that abortion takes place in this country in some instances with the support of uh, government, it's worse that there are places that would force employers to pay for it, especially those of us who are Catholics and Christians who recognize that this is an egregious affront to our faith, to our God in whom we believe and profess. And if some of you are like shaking your head, like, are you serious? Is this real? I encourage you again to check it out at catholicvote.org. Read the fuller story. But let's be mindful that some of these may be so shocking that this is, you know, maybe five or six lines erased down the road. Like we should have gotten at the first line. And by the way, the momentum for this will keep going until you and I leaning lean into this. And I think speak up about it, sharing these articles, talking about them with our friends as we are so-called. We can't be on the sidelines. And it doesn't matter really if you are informed or an expert. You can simply, you know, go to CatholicVote.org, see these articles, even just post it and say, what do you think about this? Because most people are really incredulous about a lot of the evil that's taking place. So to be informed about that, I think, and pray about it is extremely important. A theme of the next few years will be the persecution of Catholic schools, Jewish schools, and all other religious schools that blend even a trace of traditional morality with their faith, writes Tim Carney. The activist left will attack, sue, defund, and ultimately try to quash all conservative religious schools that do not adopt their version of morality. 
This question, of course, was brought up uh, in our conversation with Treasurer Robert Sprague on DEI and LGBTQ things. So again, it's perhaps troubling enough that somebody would not know their core identity. It's another that it would be imposed upon us, especially those entities, public schools and such, businesses, right, um, that reveals a kind of level of tyranny, really, quite frankly, the absence of what it means to be liberal. The classical sense of liberal was to be free to choose the good, if you will. Now we're seeing kind of a, dare I say, fascism, an imposed morality, we even say religion in a small r sense, upon those regardless of whether you subscribe to these values or not. And again, they will keep moving this line further until we step up and say enough, until we stand in the gap. So just the context for that story, it's the, um, the Democrats' latest campaign Mm-hmm. And focus is, is against religious schools in general. And finally, the United States can be, quote, a place of spiritual renewal, end quote, and growth for the Catholic Church, according to Cardinal Robert Seurat, Archbishop Emeritus of Conakry, Guinea. The Cardinal said there is, quote, much to celebrate, end quote, about the Catholic community in the United States. Woohoo! The American church is, quote, very different from the church in Europe, he observed. The faith Mm -hmm. in Europe is dying and in some places is dead, end quote. So Mm -hmm. one, he is an incredible, holy man, I think a living saint, Mm -hmm. courageous, um, prayerful, deep, deep, deep love of the Lord in his church and a man of such courage. And so for him to <laughs> applaud us in any fashion is a big we'll thing, it. I think. So let that be a story of hope as, as we conclude our loop um, segment mm. uh, and prayers for our church leaders in a special way um, because it is not an easy time. We concluded with him after this, perhaps heavy moments of the loop and even in our conversation, some subjects that came up with Treasure Robert Sprague. And it really is important that we see that it was anchored in the first part of the program tonight, talking about the storms that surround us and this boat that is the church that Christ is in. If we would just be mindful of his presence, it's so much more than just checking the boxes and going to Mass and praying the rosaries, even in novenas, all of that which is so good. The heart of all that is relationship, to be aware of our Father's love for us in Christ, his desire is to be in friendship with him that gives us, I don't know, a sense of peace, a sense of clarity of our minds, clarity of how we should act. And uh, we're so blessed to be on that journey with you. You're tuned in to Ignite Radio Live with Greg and Stephanie Schleter. Again, you can see uh, the, the program live at IgniteRadioLive.com and see the various platforms, YouTube, Spotify, and Facebook. And if you have any questions, we really eventually want to move into a place where perhaps we are live, live, and you can interact with us. But we do encourage your questions, comments, responses, alive at MassImpact.us. And we ask you to please partner with us in this movement of helping homes to become the places God designed them to be places of ever deeper encounter with Christ through interaction, through that empathetic attunement to one another. And this living gathering, God makes that possible. Free resources. If you're a parish and you're wanting to uh, consider ways that your parish could fully come alive with this, we'd love to have that conversation with you. So contact us again, live at massimpact.us. Please go to ilovemyfamily.us and click on that partnership tab. We'd be so grateful for your support. Until next time, God, God bless, bless you. you. God, I'm still counting my blessings.